Um, well, thank you very much, Robin, for the introduction. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I, Ari uh, has talked about the history of STS. Uh, the title I've been given is History and STS. And of course, that conjunction uh, invites one to tell a tale of two disciplines, that, that there, are, there are two things, the history of science and Maybe it's called science studies, maybe it's called science and technology studies, maybe now it's called science, technology, and innovation studies. But that thing, uh, there are two things and they have some kind of a relationship about which we want to reflect. And of course, there's an awful lot to say for that, uh, some of which Ari's already brought up. There are lots of, as it were, classic disciplinary markers in place when we're here to celebrate the second meeting of the new society, uh, ASSIST. Uh, and this is, this is classically what happens when a professional group feels a sense of itself as distinctive and different. Uh, a new society emerges, uh, a sense of different journals that one aspires to publish in. Uh, it's in the names of the units where we work. I work in a center for history and philosophy of science. Uh, and, and, and these come to matter. So uh, one shouldn't be in denial about that, it seems to me. Neither should we be in denial in kind of what it feels like on the ground to be a part of the STIS community and, and not to be a part of it. Uh, one can have shared interests in science and technology and innovation and yet find it a bit of a struggle sometimes to come together and to make intellectual music. Uh, and anyone who's, who's uh, tried to involve themselves in uh, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary discussions will know what I mean. You know what it, what it is to be with someone with whom you're not quite on the same page. Uh, and and we've, th there, there, there are elements of that too, which it seems to me, again, we ought not to be in denial about. Um, there is very good, if uh, somewhat small, academic literature on the relationship between the history of science and STS. Uh, Sheila Jasanoff and Lorraine Dastin uh, are among the most notable uh, uh, figures in this, in this area. It's a slightly sour literature uh, for, for whatever reason. People recording their dismay about what's been, what, where it's going, they don't call, they don't write, uh, uh, but, uh, but it, it does exist. So um, I don't want to, to uh, forget that there's lots of ways in which these are separate, but, but, but uh, I also think that we ought to beware exaggeration. And my remarks here are in the spirit of the old joke uh, that there are two kinds of people, those who think there are two kinds of people and those who know there aren't. <laughs> uh, because there are never just two separate stable entities, right? We all, we all know that if we only think of Robert Merton's name has already come up, we know where do we trace ourselves from? Uh, there it is in the title of Merton's uh, first extraordinary book. Science, Technology, and Society in 17th Century England. Throughout the past, there has been messiness. Right into the present, here at uh, Edinburgh, two very large ERC-funded projects, Miguel's and Jane's, are projects with have, which have history built into them uh, right from the start. Uh, my own thinking about these kinds of topics is, is informed by an exemplary figure in bringing the fields together. But it's also, I think, an exemplary article. And it's, I think it's a service uh, to bring it to the attention of you who don't know it. Uh, Simon Schaffer's How Disciplines Look, which was actually awarded a prize by the British Society for the History of Science. And I hope I'm not you know, being overly crude, but one of, the, one of the points that Simon makes in this piece is that it's often only people trying to create a new interdiscipline who begin talking up the stability and coherence of past disciplines. They only acquire stable identities in retrospect and in the polemics uh, of people trying to shut old things down and start something new. Otherwise, all disciplines are always interdisciplines. They are always heterogeneous. They are always a motley. That is just as true of the history of science now as it's always been, and it's just as true for STS as well. So in most of what I'm going to say uh, from here on out, I'm going to put aside the two disciplines notion and just uh, work with, with my materials, which will be hybrid materials. But I'll come back at the very end uh, to say something a little bit more about it.
The particular focus of my remarks is going to be a favorite Edinburgh School case study of mine. Uh, I, I've actually brought in my photocopy. I wish I'd had the wit to bring the real thing because it's not just as, as Ari was saying that there is a, an oral history to be recovered and captured. There's also a material culture because uh, what I've got at home is the typescript in a cardboard folder and it's so evocative of its time which is uh, 1974. Uh, that I thought you would have got a kick out of it. But anyway, all I have today is the photocopy. Um, here's oh, one last slide. It's called Biometrician versus Mendelian, A Controversy and Its Explanation by Donald McKenzie and Barry Barnes, September 1974. Are either of them here, just to check? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so what I, what I want to do... Uh, in my presentation is to give you a brief introduction to this extraordinary paper, then to tell you why, in my view, 40 years later, uh, the history of science uh, has moved on to the point where it's no longer satisfactory as an analysis uh, of this controversy. But I then want to say why it's nevertheless true for me, at least, but I hope for others as well, uh, that it has permanent value, uh, and, and I'll try to expand on that uh, a bit later on. Let me just read out a little bit, uh, because uh, this is so good, and if you, uh, in, in a way, if you want to read it, you have to either contact Donald McKenzie or me, uh, because in, the, in ways that don't happen anymore, the real thing was never published. It circulated Samizdat among the Kanyashenti, but it was never actually published. It was published in German, and then an abbreviated, but much less satisfactory version appeared in English. But for the real thing, you have to go to Donald's files or to mine. Uh, but again, I'd be delighted to share it because I think it's, it's worth studying. So here's a bit from the start. Among the many controversies littering the history of science, that between the Mendelians and the biometricians in the early 20th century is as notable as any. Its study is central to the understanding of the rise of modern genetics and is also important in the history of statistics. Moreover, the controversy is well suited to sociological study in that its history has been thoroughly explored and described. And among the workers who have undertaken this task, there appears to be little disagreement about the course of events. There is, in fact, a consensus upon all the main points in the story. They move so efficiently to get you to where they want. Um, <clears throat> the biometric school was a small and tightly knit group. Its leaders were the mathematician Carl Pearson, who you can see on your far left, and the zoologist W.F.R. Weldon, there in the middle. The Mendelian side of the debate was more amorphous, and we will concentrate our attention on the leading British Mendelian, William Bateson, and his immediate co-workers. Now there follows in the paper this bravura synthesis and summary of the existing historical literature up to that point really something. Uh, and it ends with a, a list of what they see as the key issues in the controversy over Gregor Mendel's paper and whether Mendel's recently rediscovered paper on pea hybrids deserved or didn't deserve to be at the center of a new science of inheritance with the Mendelian saying absolutely and the biometrician saying no way. And this is what they picked out as the major issue of the controversy. Was evolution a process of natural selection of continuous differences, as the biometricians following Darwin held, or did it proceed in discontinuous jumps, as Bateson argued? So that, for them, is what this was about. Continuity in nature or discontinuity? Now, they move from description of the controversy to explanation. And here the intellectual level goes up very high indeed. Because they uh, undertake a very sophisticated historiographic uh, discussion of what it would be to explain this controversy. What it would be to explain how there came to be two groups that held divergent views, those divergent views. And they raise candidate explanations and, and then reject them. What about explanations in terms of the psychologies of the individuals involved? No, they're no good. 
Uh, and one of the reasons they're no good is that we're dealing precisely with groups. So the psychologies of Bateson versus Pearson can't take us very far explanatorily. What about the real structure of nature? Maybe one side got it right. The Mendelians just got it right. And the biometricians got it wrong. Well, here famously, uh, the symmetry principle comes into play. And they, they, they don't call it the symmetry principle, but they talk about symmetric and asymmetric explanations and why it's inappropriate to say that one side held the view they did because nature is that way, and the other side held the views they did because they were socially and politically deranged in various ways. Um, that's not on. As a matter of the logic of explanation, you know, that's, the, that's the level they're, they're working at. What about different kinds of training? Here they move much more slowly. Uh, a very rich discussion of the question of to what extent different kinds of training on the different sides might account for the, the different views that they hold. And in the end, they decide that won't do either, not least because both uh, Bateson and Weldon had trained more or less the same in the same place at the same time, at zoology at Cambridge. So they've examined all of the alternative candidates. Finally, they get you to what they want. Why we need exactly the kind of explanation that David Bloor had been defending in his own writings at this time, a social explanation. We must seek to give the controversy further grounding for which we must turn to wider sociological explanations, invoking the whole range of socializing experiences of the actors involved and the general milieu of their time. And then they give that explanation and roughly what they say is that on the Mendelian side, we have William Bateson, the son of the head of St. John's College, Cambridge, an aristocrat and a conservative. So Bateson is a social and political conservative. He prefers stasis in society and he backs a view of nature in which he finds stasis as well. On the other side, the biometrician side, represented for their purposes by Carl Pearson, we have a middle class, boy who in his social views favors gradual and progressive change and likewise in his natural views wants to endorse a theory seeing natural uh, uh, progressive gradual change uh, as the way. So that's roughly how the rest of the paper goes. The way to understand the controversy is to see that the social and political interests on each side was allied with, matched uh, the views that they took about natural change. That's why this dispute had the character it did. That's why it was irresolvable on its own terms. So as I say, they take Pearson to be the representative on the biometrician side, Bateson on the Mendelian side. How does all that look 40 years later? The, his the history on which they draw to make that kind of a case. Let me take the Mendelian side first. And then we'll move on to the biometrician side. For Bateson, uh, Barnes and McKenzie drew very heavily on a remarkable paper published in 1970 by the historian Wilman Coleman called Bateson and Chromosomes. And it's the most amazing combination of Marxian sociology of knowledge and Whig history of science. Uh, these two things that you don't often think would go together, but they do remarkably here. Because uh, Coleman asks, it was an American historian, an American historian of biology, quite straight-laced, but then the 60s happened, and, and he, he got a bit Marxist. And this paper uh, asks a very Whig question, quite an American mid-century kind of a question. Uh, there was William Bateson, as a young man, uh, so innovative, able to grasp onto the Mendelian theory and to back it. Bateson, through the 19, from 1900 to 1910, is right, at the, right at, the, uh, at the edge. But thereafter, he loses it because he fails to embrace the chromosome theory of the Mendelian gene. So how, this is the Whig question, how could it be a guy could get it so right for 10 years and then get it so wrong thereafter? And his answer comes from uh, Karl Mannheim. Uh, Karl Mannheim's uh, an extraordinary essay in the sociology of knowledge from the 1920s on the conservative style of thought. Because Coleman's rather uh, clever answer 
is that the way to understanding both why Bateson seized upon Mendelism and why he resisted the chromosome theory is to see that he is a conservative. He belongs to the conservative style of thought. And to belong to the conservative style of thought on the Monhamian analysis is to, uh, first of all, be a kind of an, an esthete, right? So you resist, you, you reject utility, you reject reason, you reject democracy. Uh, in Monheim's original analysis, it's very much a, a part of the German uh, Hegelian moment. So that's the paper on which uh, Barnes and Mackenzie draw to put Bateson on the side of the debate which prefers stasis in society and therefore prefers it in nature. One of the problems with Coleman's paper, however, is that it ignores, which is kind of extraordinary over 96 pages, it ignores utterly the extent to which William Bateson was devoted to campaigning for the utility of Mendelian genetics in agriculture. He was no esthete snob who looked down on the practical goals of the breeder and the trader. Right from the start in 1902, uh, Bateson was energetically going to uh, breeders and saying to them, everything now has changed for you. Thanks to the Mendelian theory, you will have the power to plug hereditary qualities in and out of plants and animals in just the way the chemist is able to plug elements in and out. The Mendelian theory is our atomic theory. Right, so far from rejecting atomism, materialism, uh, both in a commercial sense and in, a, in a, a, a scientific explanatory sense, Bateson embraced them. He was, in 1911, uh, invited as, uh, to give the presidential address to the agricultural section of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And he used the occasion to reflect in ways that I think are still worth reading on the relations between pure and applied science and how they might work, what state-funded science ought to look like, how you make room both for people doing what we now call blue skies research and people actively ensuring that that research ultimately gets translated onto the farm. In 1921, he was called as a, as a witness, an expert witness, in a trial on about peas. Uh, that's how successful he'd become in marketing himself to the breeders as someone who actually knew commercially valuable things. So Bateson, uh, as he's depicted in the Barnes Mackenzie uh, paper, just isn't the Bateson we've come to know over the last 40 years. What about the other side? Uh, a lot depends on making Pearson your focus. Pearson was a very unusual man in lots of ways. Uh, it also is becoming more and more clear, however, that he really wasn't the brains behind the opposition to Mendelism. The brains behind the opposition to Mendelism was the biologist, not the mathematician, W.F.R. Weldon. He was a Darwinian to his fingertips, but if you had asked him, what are you really uh, against? He would not have answered uh, what he's against is this notion that nature moves by leaps. And one way into what Weldon actually wanted is to look at um, an image from uh, the first critical article he published in 1902 uh, against Mendel. Now you'll all remember from textbooks that Mendel uh, deals with yellow and green peas, round and wrinkled peas. Well, if you look at the, the top six cells there, what Weldon found is that other people's peas don't look like Gregor Mendel's. Uh, yes, in the cell number one there, you get green seeded peas. Yes, in cell number six, you get yellow seeded. But otherwise, you get a spectrum. Weldon thought we ought to want a science of inheritance which is true to all of the data, not to just an idealized, fictionalized form of the data. And he reckons that the real problem with Mendelism, which is Gregor Mendel's paper blown up to a kind of a world view, was ultimately the conception of dominance that one gets when one forgets about all of the actual variability. The Mendelian concept of dominance, as Weldon saw it, was problematic because it was absolute. It told the scientists that once you have a yellow, once you have a factor for yellowness in the germ, you will get yellowness and you don't need to pay attention to anything else. You don't need to pay attention to what else is happening inside the germ, inside the body, inside the wider physico-chemical environment. And in Weldon's view, that was false to the best of 
late 19th century biology, where what they had learned, if they had learned anything, was that a tissue expresses its capacities only in interaction with other tissues. What you get is going to be context dependent. And he has a remarkable passage in this 1902 paper in which he talks about that other stock Mendelian example for us, brown eyes and blue eyes. And he says, uh, I'll paraphrase and then we'll read what he says. He says that uh, depending on what you choose in getting your Mendelian cross going, depending on how you purify your stocks, depending on what you eliminate and what you keep in, you can get different patterns going. And you can declare that pattern to be the law and everything else to be an exception to it. But it will just be arbitrary because you could get different patterns going having made different choices. And he makes this point with respect to eye color. He says, it would almost certainly be possible by selecting cases of marriage between men and women of appropriate ancestry to demonstrate for their families a law of dominance of dark over light eye color, which is what we expect, or of light over dark. You could get either one going, depending on the choices you make. Such a law might be as valid for the families of selected ancestry as Mendel's laws are for his peas and for other peas of probably similar ancestral history. But it would fail when applied to dark and light-eyed parents in general, that is, to parents of any ancestry who happen to possess eyes of given color. And Weldon went on to develop this in a book manuscript uh, that he didn't live to finish. Uh, it now exists in its uncompleted form at the archive uh, in UCL. I've been working for a little bit too long now to try to bring out a scholarly edition of it. I, I hope to do that soon. But to give you just a, a little taste of it, uh, he begins, as you'd expect from someone who was a biometrician, talking about statistics. And he says statistics matter because they are the mathematical languages, the, the mathematical language that captures variability that doesn't uh, force us to idealize it away. The rest of the manuscript is devoted to developmental biology. <laughs> but because what Weldon says is that the choice we face in the early 20th century is between two conceptions of dominance. A conception of dominance which is absolute, right, which insists that context doesn't matter, and a concept of dominance which is relative which insists on context and the variability it brings about. Which of these should we choose? The Mendelian absolute conception or the Galtonian relative conception? And the rest of the book is a tour of developmental biology of the day, showing that over and over and over again, experimental embryologists had shown that the capacities of tissues would not be guessed at without disrupting the usual interrelations. What a tissue does within a body depends utterly on what it's interacting with. This was, for Weldon, the state of the art in 1904-1905. And you can summarize his view like this. Uh, variation matters. We ought to want a science of inheritance that takes into account all of the variability, not just a portion of it. Secondly, ancestry matters. The long ancestry. Uh, when you do a Mendelian cross, you are permitted to forget about the long backstory, provided you have true breeding stocks. Uh, but in Weldon's view, that was a mistake. Thirdly, environment matters. Environment at every level, uh, within the germ cell, within the, 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 the water physiology of the animal, the water physical chemical environment. We want a science of inheritance that doesn't forget all of that. And again, for him, it all comes down to the conception of dominance. Is it going to be absolute or is it going to be relative? So I think when you add all of that together, when you have both uh, the problems with accepting William Bateson as a kind of esthete conservative snob, and on the other side, a picture of the biometricians led not by Carl Pearson, but by the very different WFR Weldon, who was much less invested in global social political schemes than Pearson was, who held very different views about science, about biology, uh, and for whom it was uh, a relative conception of dominance, not continuity in nature that mattered. Um, then I think if we go back to the classic Barnes and McKenzie case study, it just doesn't work. It's a, a beautiful theory killed by ugly facts. So does that mean that uh, the, I thought to me it was a little distressing the number of times in Ari's talk when he continued said, you know, you may not know these names, you may not read these people. Um, does that mean I, that I think you shouldn't read uh, Barnes and McKenzie? On the contrary, 
uh, I think that um, the paper remains a high point for what it is to take seriously the explanatory challenge of change in the history of science and to do it in a way which uh, sticks to the very highest standard of evidence. That to me is what this paper does and furthermore it does it in a way which is uh, explicitly part of the Marxian sociology of knowledge tradition which by the time it got to Barry Barnes had become an enormously sophisticated subtle instrument uh, and in his book Interests and the Growth of Knowledge uh, from the late 70s he has beautiful passages in which he explains that the the strength of the strong program as it were lies precisely in the weakness of the claims being made about the extent to which uh, you can read off a society's science from its social structure. Barnes and Mackenzie didn't stand for anything like that, nothing anything like as crude as that. Rather they thought the job of the analyst was to understand how contingently because of the particular time and place, because of the way alliances happen to form uh, in a, a particular time and place and not otherwise, things went the way they did. So to me all of that remains immensely inspiring. So one asks if you, if you can't just appeal to Barnes and Mackenzie in 1974 as having sorted out the Mendelian controversy, where do you go? And to me at least, trying to finish my own work in this area, the challenge is to meet their standards but in, in a way that works for the 21st century. Now in, in posing this challenge to myself and asking well what would it be to have a, a well evidenced uh, a well evidenced answer to the question it occurred to me that taking seriously the contingency of the Barnes McKenzie view a contingency which is now widespread in the field I mean that is to say the, 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 the notion that what happens in the history of science might have gone differently I think if you take the Mendelian controversy and ask well well how differently could it have gone could the biometricians have won had things worked out a little bit differently had Weldon lived long enough to publish his book had he been more effective than he was in getting students had he been more energetic uh, in appealing to breeders could it have been a little different and what if it had so what what difference would it make uh, and it occurred to me that I couldn't now bring back a Weldonian biology from the history of science that never was but I could imagine what a textbook would look like if it came out of that Weldonian counterfactual history of science and unbelievably I got a grant uh, to write it uh, and so uh, we actually um, asked ourselves well let's suppose that suppose that you didn't start kids off in a classroom as happens at the University of Leeds where I'm based but happens around the world probably happens at Edinburgh too with Mendel and his peas as the first lesson right it's Mendel and his peas and then gradually the complexity ratchets up and then at a certain point they meet gene environment interaction as a kind of cognitive luxury item uh, but what they remember and what we all remember is green and yellow peas brown and blue eyes so suppose that you didn't give them that as a foundation suppose that instead you gave them as a foundation something like the role that genes play in the condition of their heart in other words, something which is genuinely representative of the role that genes play in most of the health issues that they will ever face, uh, but, but also something in which from the start you're thinking about genes as interacting with other genes, with other things in the body, with the wider environment, with nutrition, with age. Suppose you were to start kids off like that and you did it in a way which didn't send them screaming from the room because it was all so complex. You've, you somehow you figured out how to do that. And suppose that throughout the course you then hammered home interaction, gene environment interaction as the main theme, as primary and pervasive rather than secondary and optional. And suppose that once they actually got to Mendel and his peas, they got to Mendel and his peas not as the big generalization on which to hang everything else, but as a special case. Interesting precisely because unusual unusual to get those patterns when you're not dealing with very high inbred lineages of flies or domesticated cattle or whatever it might be. So suppose you could do all that. What would the students be like at the end? In particular, might they be just a little bit less determinist uh, about genes than students coming out of an ordinary Mendelian class? So as I say, we ran the experiment. Uh, the uh, 
the experimental design was not ideal uh, because we learned right away that uh, the biologists at Leeds would not let us mess with their students. Um, <laughs> but we were allowed to mess with art students. Uh, so we, we, we ran a, our, our experimental course was a, a voluntary course taken by uh, philosophy students mainly as a kind of uh, extra course. Our control group were the students sitting Genetics 101. Uh, and before and after the teaching in both groups, we gave them uh, questionnaires meant to assess their levels of genetic determinism. And what we found is that students coming out of the Mendelian curriculum were just as determinist about genes at the end as they were at the start. Uh, students coming out of a Weldonian interactionist curriculum were less so, and, and to a, a statistically significant degree. So as I say, our, our experimental design has lots of room for improvement. And over the next few years, I'm, I'm hoping to see the, uh, improvements both in the design, uh, but also in the curriculum. So if I ask myself, well, what do I call this disciplinarily? Uh, is this still the history of science? Is this, is this STIS? Is this pedagogic studies? Um, I, I'm not too, too worried about that. Uh, but I want to give you a slogan to think with, uh, at least, um, with apologies to Immanuel Kant. Um, STIS without history of science is empty, and history of science without STIS is blind. I'd like to think that uh, we save you from inanity, uh, and, and perhaps you save us from antiquarianism. That would be, that would be one way of, of thinking about it. But I, I do mean at the end there, it's like in his exam question, discuss. And I'll just end by saying that the British Society for the History of Science, who's one of the sponsors of this meeting, uh, would be only too delighted to carry on a genuine conversation about this. We have our annual meeting at York in July, uh, but also in two years' time, in September 2018, um, we are going to be hosting the European Society for the History of Science meeting um, in London. This goes back to Miguel's uh, point about uh, what kind of a moment this is. And we're very much hoping that that meeting will be a chance for all of the associations in the UK, which are in one way or another involved with science and technology, uh, to come together and, and work together. So we hope we can carry on the conversation there as well. Thank you.